The book of Acts, chapter 9, we're going to read the first 31 verses this morning. It's worth remembering what we know, that the study of God's Word, the hearing of it, is the most profound and exciting thing happening in the world right now. There is nothing more exciting, more transforming, more humbling than what we are about to do. We are about to hear God's voice written for us in His Word. Let's begin in verse 1 of chapter 9. But Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem." Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank." Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. And when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, 
And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It multiplied. On August 21st, 1887, a man named August Friedrich Jager was born. When he was later in life, certain things began to take place in his homeland of Germany, and he became a high official in the Nazi government. As the history goes, you can read this online or many different places, documents used in evidence at the Nuremberg trials concluded that the Nazis planned to de-Christianize Germany. A report entitled, The Nazi Master Plan, the Persecution of Christian Churches, prepared by the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner to the American CIA, says, important leaders of the National Socialist Party would have liked complete extirpation of Christianity and the substitution of a purely racial religion. The report stated that the best evidence for the existence of an anti-church plan was to be found in the systematic nature of the persecution of Germany's churches. Jager was a German official of the Nazi area. In the Reichsgau, Wirthland, Polish areas annexed by Nazi Germany, Jager served as administrative chief to the regional leader, Arthur Greiser. Earth, earlier, Jager had led the effort, effort at Nazification of the Evangelical Church in Prussia. And in Poland, he earned the nickname Kirchen Jager, Church Hunter, for the vehemence of his hostility to the Catholic Church. Church Hunter. Jager was not the first. The first church hunter rightly earning that title could be Saul. Saul the church hunter. Not content merely to oppress the church in Jerusalem, he would seek them out. He would find them. He would bind them. He would see them murdered. That was his desire. This story in Acts 9, one of the highlights in a book of highlights, is about the power and grace of Jesus Christ on display in the life of his most determined enemy. This story is about Saul, but it's more importantly about the transforming grace of Jesus Christ and what he is able to do even in the heart and life of his most determined enemy, the church hunter of the early church. Saul, the Christian killer. Saul, the man who stood by Stephen's persecutors and executioners, calmly watching their robes so that they could throw the stones more freely that sent him to his death. Saul, who had bound himself by this task, he would search out any who belonged to the way of Jesus Christ. He would bring them bound to Jerusalem in hopes that they would face the same fate. If, if we're going to feel the shock that's present throughout this story, and you see it even in the second half of the chapter, shock in Jerusalem, shock among the Jews in Damascus, shock uh, in Ananias, you see shock, we have to first feel who was this man that this story is about. Now, we know who he becomes 
If we've been a Christian any length of time, we know who he becomes. But we have to study who was he. We have to feel what Christians reading this would have felt. We have to sort of lay aside our uh, wonderful American heritage of religious freedom and religious protections and feel what a, a young Christian in this first century or even reading uh, the book of Acts in later years would have felt when you hear the name Saul of Tarsus. It would have felt much more like a, a Christian in Poland if they heard the name August Jager. He was the stuff of nightmares. This was the man who would come barging into a church meeting with violence, bind Christians, and drag them to prison. This was the man that you sought to avoid. You sought to protect your friends from him. You sought to hide your children from him. You sought to avoid any word of the next church meeting being leaked to him. This was that man, Saul of Tarsus, the church hunter. We have to feel that reality, that was who he was. And he is on his way to Damascus because he is not content with the death of Stephen in Jerusalem. He wants to see anybody, anybody who claims that Jesus Christ, the crucified one, is the Messiah. They must be exterminated. He saw himself likely as the second coming of Phineas, the man in the Israelite camp who wandered throughout the camp looking to exterminate from Israel, those who would blaspheme the name of God. He claimed to be representing God, and yet his heart is filled with murder at those who claim that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's where we find ourselves in verses 1 and 2. That's the background. That's the setting. That's what the story has to assume if it's going to affect us the way it affected the rest of the Christians in this passage and certainly the rest of the Christians in the book of Acts. The, the conversion of, of, of Saul is told three times in Acts, and each time the different details come out. I think because it is intended as a, a sort of prototypical window, a vision into the transforming power of God. Obviously, Paul is unique in his calling, in his mission, but what is not unique is the Savior that he encounters. And the reason that story is told three times is, I think, to emphasize that his life is a, sort of a, a, a demonstration of just how powerful this risen Savior is. He can take even his worst enemy and turn him into an ambassador for his gospel. Three sections I want to use to walk through the story, and then when we get through it, we'll make some application for us. Three sections. First of all, converted enemy. Converted enemy. As he is walking along, this enemy of the church, an enemy of God, suddenly is encountered, we notice in verse 3, by a light from heaven flashing around him. Very important to understand, the book of Acts is a, a narrative. It is describing actual physical events. This is not a spiritual vision, vision so to speak. It's not a dream. He actually encounters and we know this, I think that's part of the reason the details about the men who were with him heard it as well. They didn't see Jesus in the same way, but they heard the sound. They saw him fall to the ground. They, they, they were aware of something physically is taking place. And Saul is given this sight of a person, not just a light, but a person. And that person speaks to him. And the speaking voice says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So Saul's made aware this is a person right here. And he's confused. He sees that it is a, a divine kind of Shekinah glory that is shining on him. As a Jew, he would have been very aware of Old Testament theophanies where the glory of God was revealed. He must be assuming this is happening. Who are you, Lord? Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Not the main point of the passage, but it's been noted multiple times and worth noting again. So valuable to see how Jesus identifies himself with his church. Saul, in persecuting and hunting the church, in the eyes of the church's Lord, is persecuting and hunting the Lord. This is the worst possible news for Saul. This 
clearly heavenly figure, clearly surrounded by divine glory, is claiming that Saul, in all of his murderous threats and all of his antagonism and all of his persecution, has been opposing this one who is clearly glorified. And then the even worse news, here he hears, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And in a moment, Saul's worldview goes crumbling to the ground. What Saul had assumed was impossible, was blasphemous, was that the man, Jesus, the one who died on the cross, was under God's curse, was condemned by the high priest, could not be who people were claiming him to be. There was no way that a man, and especially a cursed man, a crushed man, a dead man, a criminal, under accusation could possibly be an object of worship. This was defiance of the first commandment, and these people must be destroyed. And suddenly that's turned upside down. Once again, Acts turns things upside down. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. You want to see the reversal that takes place immediately, the reversal of a worldview, and then the reversal of who is strong and powerful and who is abruptly weak. The men are trembling. Those who are assumingly going to help him persecute the church, they are trembling. Saul falls to the ground. He cannot even stand, and now he cannot even see. So from driving confidently, probably on his horse with the companions, he's, he's going there to Damascus, and, and there, as he's there, this is a long journey. It's 180 miles or so from Jerusalem to Damascus, over 100 miles, Jerusalem to Damascus. He's been going. He's almost there. He's made this whole journey, and when he, before he reaches it, he hits the ground, he hears the voice, he can't see, and he has to be led like a child into the city. The comparison of power here is very important. And for three days, it says, he was without sight and he neither ate nor drank. Probably his fast is some combination of repentance and shock at the overwhelming nature of the sight he has just beheld. Jesus of Nazareth has divine glory. And that begins to penetrate him. What can that mean? It's all true. In verse 10, we see that God has been planning for this event not merely to leave Paul shaken and broken, but restored and commissioned. There's a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord meets him as well. I, I read one commentator this week who made the point that Jesus met both Saul and Ananias in different ways and changed them in different ways as well. Here I am, Lord, he says. Much like Isaiah, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. Ironic, the street called Straight would normally reference the way of straightness or righteousness. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. Now, Ananias is understandably reluctant, so he appeals to the Lord. Lord, I have heard much about this man. Can I just double check, Lord? I've heard much about this man, how much evil he's done. He's come here to lay hands on all of us and drag us back to Jerusalem. But the Lord says again, go. And then even more amazing, he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles, and he will share in the suffering that you are referring to. The very suffering he intended to perpetrate, he will participate in. Worth noting Ananias' obedience. Imagine the moment for a, a Christian in Poland, just to make it practical, imagine he sees a vision of the Lord and the Lord says to him, go and pray for this man who is the church hunter. I have chosen him to be my representative around the world. And in that moment, the test of his belief in the true power and transforming grace of his Savior is, is questioned, is put to the test. Can God save the church hunter? Not just save him, can he choose him to become a representative of his gospel? 
Can God turn the church hunter into a fisher of men? But Ananias obeys. He goes to the house. He lays his hands on him. Saul is healed. Notice the affectionate term, probably hard for Ananias to utter, but he trusts God and says, Brother Saul, He sent me to you so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Spirit. And immediately something like scales fall off his eyes. He regains his sight. He rises. He is baptized. In the book of Acts, we baptize. It's not just a physical event. It's a physical event that is a confession of belief and surrender and identification. It's not like in the States where in some ways you can get baptized and nobody's going to be significantly aware of that. To be baptized is making this overwhelming cultural statement. I have rejected the teaching of my former teachers and my leaders. I, I am claiming identification with this crucified Nazarene, and I trust that he is who his followers say he is, and I have dedicated my life to him overwhelming conversion. The enemy is now a disciple. The enemy has been converted. He claims Jesus as his Lord. He entrusts himself to him. He identifies himself with him. The church hunter is lowered down into the water as an expression publicly of submission and belief in the crucified carpenter from Nazareth. Converted enemy. Converted enemy. Paul's story is perhaps the greatest salvation story in the New Testament. It reveals for us the transforming grace of our Savior and invites us to believe in him and to remember that Paul's Savior is also the one who rescues and transforms today. Incredible. And the transformation was only just beginning. God did not just save him to sit him somewhere and to remind him of how much grace he had received. He saved him to send him. He saved him to send him out. And if you notice, I was thinking this week, actually, you can, you can notice people that encounter Jesus Christ in the Gospels almost immediately and invariably begin telling other people about him. It happens in the Gospels. When Jesus first goes to the disciples and reveals to them who he is, almost invariably, you notice, in the next passage, there'll be somebody who says, then they, they went and got their brother and came and showed him to Jesus. It's the same pattern here. Paul encounters Jesus. He is converted. He is transformed, radically transformed, and immediately he begins fulfilling his commission, which obviously is unique in its scope and authority. And for some days, it says he was in with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue. So the next section of this story we might call the suffering witness. The suffering witness. Paul doesn't just become converted in belief. He comes converted in who he is representing, who he is witnessing. He begins to preach Jesus in the synagogues. We have to re-enter the shock of this. It's been days. I mean, think about that in a modern context. Again, you, you have this, this guy. I'm using this, this Nazi official just to help us appreciate a more modern area. What, what would that be like? Think about that. You have this guy. He's hunting churches, decimating Christians. He gets converted. He has a moment with Ananias. And from Friday, let's call it, to Monday, in Monday, he walks into this religious gathering and he begins proclaiming, Jesus is the Christ. I mean, nobody would have, every, everybody that knew him knew him as this brutal, legendary assassin of Christians. And here he is standing, you can imagine Christians thinking, this is a trick. This has got to be fake. This is impossible. And he's standing up there because he's proclaiming, Jesus, Jesus, the real human Jesus. Jesus, he is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the chosen one. He is God's chosen Savior. 
Incredible. Verse 20 is incredible. Immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. And no wonder, verse 21, all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priest? Verse 22, but Saul increased all the more in strength. And I love this word. It's a great word for every enemy and what they attempt to do to the gospel in the book of Acts. He confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Incredible. So he goes from being a converted enemy to a suffering witness. He's witnessing, and he's witnessing with such power. You notice really a repetition of the same story happening twice, which just accents the point in the Bible. Whenever that happens in the Bible, that accents the point. So he's in Damascus first. He preaches, and then the Jews plot to kill him. When many days had passed, the Jews must have become convinced this is not a trick. This is real, as impossible it is, and they decide they're going to kill Paul. So they begin to hunt the church hunter. The irony of this passage just turned upside down. Only Jesus could do this. The very man who was leading them in killing Christians, they now want to kill because he's such a dangerous proclaimer of Jesus. Their plot became known to Saul, it says. They were watching the gate. Look at the zeal they have. They're watching the gates. Notice the turnaround. Acts uses irony to make the point. Such a transforming power has transformed Paul that the very thing he was looking to do is now being done to him. That's how powerful the transformation is. They were watching the gates day and night. Now, you just don't waste time to do that for some ordinary, occasionally interested Christian. You do that for someone who is so profoundly proclaiming the gospel that you decide he must be eliminated. If we let this guy keep going, I mean, the gospel could go around the whole world. His disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Paul will reference either this story or a similar occasion as one of his most humbling moments. One of the moments where his, his weakness most revealed the strength of God. So here's Paul, the confident church hunter. He's being <laughs> stuffed into a basket and lowered over a wall. I mean, it's the most unmanly, for, for a son of David, the warrior, to be stuffed into a basket and lowered over a wall. There is nothing impressive about this. But the reversal of the story showcases the transforming power of our Savior. Paul is now this man who's willing to be stuffed into a basket, lowered over a wall, because people are guarding the gates day and night to kill him because he can't stop talking about Jesus. The same thing effectively happens in Jerusalem. The story is repeated. Same thing. The disciples are understandably initially afraid. They don't want to show him where the big gathering of believers is. Who would do that? It seems foolish. But you have this wonderful man named Barnabas in verse 27 who is called the son of encouragement, just seems determined to lift up. And he, he does this with, with <laughs> throughout. Whenever we see him, we see Barnabas looking out for people who nobody wants to believe in and believing in them and helping them be restored to ministry. So in verse 27, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, how he had preached boldly in Damascus, and apparently they accept him and allow him to come in and out among them, and he begins preaching in the name of the Lord, and the same pattern repeats, he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. Now, feel the irony of this. Stephen was preaching against the Hellenists. They could not withstand him, and that's what led ultimately to his execution. Paul stood by and watched them execute him, and now you have the same man there disputing against them, representing Jesus, and they are seeking to kill him. So Stephen's prayer that God would not hold this sin against them has become fulfilled in the life of his executioner. His executioner is now facing the same Hellenists. They are seeking to kill him, and the brothers to protect him send him down to Caesarea and off to Tarsus. The church hunter becomes the converted enemy, once an enemy, 
now a disciple. And being a disciple, a witness from persecutor to sufferer. What's the explanation for this? Well, Acts shouts to us, Jesus Christ is able to take his most determined enemy and transform them into a witness for his name. The gospel of God's grace is able to take the one running as fast as they can to destroy the church of God and to destroy the name of Jesus and not just stop them, but turn them around and send them into the witness of the greatness of Jesus Christ such that they are now a threat to the powers of darkness. This story is, and the reason I think Paul's story is told and retold and retold is it's sort of this prototypical example for what happens to every Christian. What the nature of the gospel is, what the power of the gospel is, what the power of the Savior is, that even this church hunter can become a witness to Jesus Christ. Yes, Paul is unique, and and none of us should assume we're the apostle to the Gentile world, and we don't have his authority, and we're not going to see the risen Christ with our physical eyes. So yes, we, we should set those things aside and not assume we repeat them. However, there is some repeatable elements, and I think that's why his story is told over and over again, to showcase we believe in the same Savior who still meets enemies on the road, who still transforms them by a sight of his glory in their spirit, and who still turns them around and changes them from haters of God to lovers of God, from persecutors of Christians to proclaimers of the name. The suffering witness. Third section. Now, the growing church. Just a single verse It's a summary verse, but Luke uses these throughout Acts. It's it's worth referencing. It's worth referencing because they are sort of celebrations for the theological point to be abundantly clear. They're sort of like celebrations of what God is doing. Daryl Bach, the commentator, says, these summaries, they're dotted throughout Acts, these summaries function like triumphant choral refrains in the book as they ring out with joy over what God is doing. So, Luke says in verse 31, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace. Very meaningful since The chapter started with a church hunter coming to drag Christians into Jerusalem for execution. Instead, what happens? The church has peace and was being built up. So it's growing in the Lord. And they are walking in the fear of who? Not the church hunters, but rather the Lord. And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, what happens to them? They multiply. Rather than being reduced by the the aggressive hatred of a church hunter, they're multiplying. They're growing. People are coming into their midst because of the witness that's going forth from them. Enemy converted. Persecutor turned into a witness that suffers for the sake of the name. Church under threat becomes church growing. What's the point of all this? Believe in the transforming grace of our Savior. He can turn even his most determined enemy into a witness, and he can grow his church under the threat of persecution. God can choose his greatest missionary in the person of his greatest enemy. God can save the one who hates him and turns him into someone who loves him and loves proclaiming his name and is willing to be stuffed into a basket and lowered from a wall and suffer for the rest of his life for the sake of the one who rescued him on that road. For us, I, I think it, it's, a, it's an invitation to believe something. Believe. 
Jesus Christ has transforming grace. Paul is this exhibit throughout the New Testament. Exhibit A. Exhibit A for the true grace of God. Exhibit A. And Paul himself says this. Later in his life, he makes the point, I was chosen so that the unlimited patience of God might be put on display. That's how he thinks of himself. He's like, the reason God chose me, it's not because I was wiser or smarter or more impressive, though he was all of those things, but that's not why I was chosen. I was chosen because I was so bad, only God could turn me into what I am today. That's why I was, God specifically chose Paul because he was the church hunter. Because only a God who hunts sinners could turn a church hunter into a person proclaiming the name of Jesus. That's what Paul thinks. He says, only God picks someone like Saul to turn him into a Paul. Only God does that. Only Jesus Christ would do that. And the whole story of Paul is given to the church as an invitation. Do you believe in the grace of Jesus Christ? Do you believe in Paul-sized grace? Do you believe in Saul-sized grace? Let me, let me press that to us. Do you believe in Saul-sized grace? No, not every Christian is going to be Saul. He's unique. He's the apostle to the Gentiles, right? I mean, but, but every Christian is supposed to feel the truth of the gospel behind his story. The story is not about Paul. It's about the power of Jesus Christ to save. Do you believe in a Saul-sized grace, in a Saul-sized transforming grace from the Lord Jesus Christ, a Saul-sized Savior. Do you believe that? Do I believe that? Do we believe in a Saul-sized grace? What does this mean for us? How, how, do we, how do we believe in this? How do we affected by this story? Just two applications for us. First of all, stay close to the miracle of your own salvation. Stay close to the miracle of your own salvation. Luke, who wrote this, was a companion of Paul. I think a major reason why his conversion is told again and again and again, and then it's referenced again in First and Second Timothy when he writes to Timothy. Why is it told again and again and again? Because Paul knows it doesn't flatter me at all, but it magnifies the Lord Jesus Christ. I think the story is here largely because Paul wanted it told. I, I, I don't know if this is true. This is speculation. But I can almost imagine Paul saying to him, make sure you're very descriptive about how much I hated the church. Don't you dare leave that out. Because it's exactly how bad I was that reveals the transforming power of the grace of God in my life. And it's that same grace that is at work in the church today. Stay close to the miracle of your own salvation. Every sinner encounters Jesus Christ on their way to hell and are turned around towards heaven. Every sinner is not a church hunter, but they are a God hater. And ultimately, that's just as bad. Every sinner is opposed to God and independent from God and views Jesus as worthless and not the valuable king of kings. Stay close to the miracle of your salvation. Keep it close. Brothers and sisters, let me ask this question. Have you gotten emotional recently in thinking about your moment with Jesus Christ. Whether it was a season, a season of years, a moment, a moment where you were remembering the truth of your, your salvation. H have you stayed close to the miracle of your conversion? I don't think Paul was ever distant from that moment on the road when Jesus chose him, the church hunter. 
I don't think he was ever distant. Towards the end of his ministry, when he's writing to his young friend Timothy, he says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly, formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason that in me as the foremost Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life to the king of the ages immortal invisible the only god be honor and glory forever and ever amen brothers and sisters are you able to say that in your own words with that depth of feeling god did not save you when you were a christian he didn't save me when I was a Christian. He saved me when I was a opponent, when I was against him, when I was convinced of my own righteousness, when I was impressed with my own accomplishments. And this is very true in my case. I've never met anyone that was <laughs> so gripped by self-righteousness, by the need to earn your way to heaven. As people like, like me, I remember, I remember it was somewhat relieving for me. I met a good friend. His name is Bob Coughlin. He writes worship music and stuff. And I remember him describing what he was like as a kid. And I thought, that's the one person that I can, I can relate to a little bit because he was as bad maybe as I was. <laughs> so convinced that he could be righteous so convinced that he could confess enough and be penitent enough and do the right thing enough. That, that's what I was. And that is blasphemous to the God who sent his son to save sinners. That's the Pharisee that Jesus said goes away unjustified, convinced that his righteousness compares to God. That he can repent enough to make his way into heaven. That, that was the, the root of my heart when God saw me and said, this one will be a platform to display the patience of God. Craving the approval of man. Craving to be impressive in the eyes of others. Craving to be better than those around me. Craving to receive the adulation and appreciation of everyone who watched me. Craving that and convinced I was better. But Christ Jesus chose me so that he could display his unlimited patience as an example for those who must believe to eternal life. That's what Paul says and that's what I say. Is that what you say? Are you close to the miracle of your salvation? The great preacher George Whitfield said, I know the place. I know the place. Whenever I go to Oxford, I cannot help running to the spot where Jesus Christ first revealed himself to me and gave me the new birth. I know the place. Now, brothers and sisters, especially if you grew up in the church, you may not have a physical location. I have a friend who says he was doing drugs when he was converted, and he could take you to the spot. Many Christians I know, they don't have a spot like that physically, but we all have the same place. Spiritually speaking, we all have a place. That place was the cross of Christ where we were met with a Savior who would suffer for our sins. And we can go to that place and remember that place and stay close to the miracle of our salvation. 
Paul never forgot this moment on the road and he wrote it down and had others write it down again and again so that it could remind us Jesus Christ is able to save his worst enemies and actually that's the only people he does save. Are you close to the miracle of your salvation? How close is your own conversion and the miracle of it? Stay close. Second application. Is there anyone that you doubt could be converted by Jesus Christ? Is there anyone this story is designed to remove any doubt. That's what it's designed to do, to remove any doubt. Is there anyone that you doubt could be converted by Jesus Christ? Another George Whitfield story, you may have heard this one before, there was a group when he would preach, he would preach to thousands of people, amazing preaching gift, and there was a group called the Hellfire Club of young pagans, and they were determined to mock him and resist him. So there was one man named Thorpe uh, in this club, and he was particularly good at, at imitating Whitfield. He, could, he would study him to imitate his, his gestures and so forth, his mannerisms, and so they would have gatherings where this man Thorpe would imitate for the purpose of humor and mockery Whitfield in front of his friends. So he would, he would be Whitfield and they would make fun of him. We might think Saturday Night Live, except it's about Whitfield and the gospel, okay? So he would imitate him and they would mock him and make fun of him. Charles Spurgeon wrote the following about Mr. Thorpe. Mr. Thorpe was a member of an infidel club, and in those days, infidelity was more blasphemous than now. This infidel society took the name of the Hellfire Club, and among their amusements was that of holding imitations of religious services and exhibiting mimicries of popular ministers. He listened to Whitfield so carefully that he caught his tones and his manner and somewhat of his doctrines. When the Hellfire Club met to see his caricature of Whitfield, Thorpe opened the Bible that he might take a text to preach from it after the manner of Whitfield. And his eye fell on the passage, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. As he spoke upon that text, he was carried beyond himself, lost all thought of mockery, spoke as one in earnest, and was the means of his own conversion. Is there anyone that we doubt the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ can save? Grown children who haven't had a thought for their Bible upbringing in years? Friends that are committed to distorting the image of God in every way imaginable through their lifestyle? Co-workers who love to laugh at Jesus more than they'd be willing to listen to Jesus. People who find every crude joke hilarious and every sermon boring. People who've been burned by the local church. Some leader let them down or some church group disappointed them. children who, no matter how many times you appeal to them, their, their heart seems hard. God put Paul in this story, in the big picture, to show how he was going to get the gospel around the world. The gospel was going to go around the world on the lips of none other than the original church hunter, Saul of Tarsus. So that even in himself, he reveals. He is a living parable of the gospel he proclaims. And that same gospel is at work today. 
I don't know when or how or if any individual will be converted, but I know that if Paul can be converted on his way to crush Christians in Damascus, there is no sinner today who can encounter the risen Christ and be turned around and become a witness for that Savior. There is no person in your life and there is no person in this room who can be converted to Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus as Savior, let me tell you something right now. He knows you. And if you turn and believe in him as the substitution for your sins, you can be converted. I don't care if you've heard 5,000 messages that didn't affect you. This can be the message where you can turn from your sins and trust in him as the risen Savior, God himself, who offers himself to you to know him and to love him and to have fellowship with him for eternity. And if you believe in Jesus, that gift is yours today. And for us as Christians, let's look at everyone we know with Paul-sized glasses on. Paul-sized grace is the grace of Jesus Christ. That's the grace that would go around the gospel on the lips of this man for the rest of this book. And brothers and sisters, if Ananias, who we virtually never hear of, can be used to pray for and care for Paul, then nobody here is too weak or limited or uncertain or obscure to be used mightily in the kingdom of God. Moms, who knows whether you're praying for a missionary when you pray over your children at night? Dads, how do you know whether you're not called to preach and to pray over a preacher? The thing is the power of Jesus to save. That's the thing to be aware of. Believe. Believe, says Luke through the story of Paul. Believe in the transforming grace of Jesus Christ who can turn even the church hunter into the apostle to the Gentiles. Let's pray. So we pray for strength right now. Lord, in every relationship that we have and some, Lord, that we should build, we pray that you would give us grace to believe Paul-sized grace, the grace that shows what you are able to do. Thank you for Paul's story, Lord. Thank you that that moment on the road to Damascus for all of us was the starting point of the gospel coming to us going to the nations. And here we are, Lord, the nations. And that moment was you also reaching out for us. We thank you for that, Lord. And we pray we would be close to the miracle of our own salvation. Take us back to that moment every morning when we wake up at night before we go to bed. And use us, Lord, in the lives of those that are humanly beyond reach, but spiritually opportunities for your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.